welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Ann Dolan and I am your host tonight. This evening, we're talking about why colleges care what high schoolers do this summer. For the last 24 years, my tutors, executive function coaches, and college counselors have been helping students to perform better in school and to get into the college of their choice. So I'm particularly excited for tonight. Now, before we get started, I have a question for you. Let me know what grade your child is in. You will see a poll in front of you that will pop up in just a second. And let me know what grade your child's in. Is your child a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, or younger? Thank you so much for participating. Uh-oh, it looks like juniors and sophomores are dueling it out. <laughs> All right, awesome. Okay, so it looks like we only have a few parents of seniors here, maybe a few seniors themselves, but 34% of participants are in the junior class, 39 from the sophomore class, 14% from the freshman class, 13% um, are eighth graders, and then um, 7% of parents have kids younger. Awesome, thank you so much. So mostly juniors and sophomores, that's good to know. And also, um, if you have a younger child, welcome. I hope you learn a lot about the whole college program. All right, so let's get started. I'm so, so excited tonight to have Lisa Gastaldi with me. Lisa is our college consultant here at Educational Connections. And she has 20 years of experience as a college counselor and as a school counselor. And in fact, she's national board certified. She has a master's in counseling psychology and she's a member of NACAC, which is the National Association for College Admission Counseling, among other organizations. So a bit more about Lisa. She's worked with over 4,000 students um, to help them get into the school of their choice, which includes top universities like the Ivy Leagues, UVA, Duke, University of Chicago, University of California, Stanford, and UNC, among lots of others. But most importantly, she helps kids find the right fit for them. And she's been to over 500 campuses. So Lisa, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you, Anne. We're talking about summer options for students, but one thing I wanna say before we get into um, what the webinar is that balance is the key. Students can still do some fun things this summer, but they will have some uh, meaningful activities, hopefully planned. That's important because yes, you're right. Um, kids need to find that balance in the summer. So let's talk a little bit about what kids can do by grade level. And let's start out with our current juniors. There are rising seniors. What should they be thinking of uh, when it comes to their summer? So I have a funny actually story to start tonight. So my when a couple of years ago, I was meeting with a family, mom and dad and their son. And I asked him what he was going to do over the summer. He was a, he was a rising senior. And he said I was going to he was going to surf and he was going to watch Netflix. So I explained to him that, yes, it's possible for him to surf and to watch Netflix, but it was also important for him to try and find an activity that would be meaningful for him to put on his resume and add to his college applications. Colleges want and universities want to see what you choose to do with substantial amount of free time. So colleges want to enroll students that are going to engage in their academic uh, experience and be involved participants in classroom and their community. So needless to say, he did have a productive summer um, and he did, did some- What did he end up doing, by the he way? He ended up volunteering. Um, he was, yep, he was gonna be a volunteer. He volunteered over the summer. So yes. Nice. So what do rising seniors need to think about this summer in terms of um, their college list? What's that all about? So, um, you know, we, we start out this, for, um, this webinar for seeing rising seniors and that, that has a purpose. For students wanting to avoid stress and have well thought out college applications um, and to stay organized over the summer is an excellent time to start this process and get focused on their college applications. So prior to summertime, um, juniors should approach their teachers for letters of recommendation um, and a helpful um, and to complete a brag sheet for their teacher. This provides the teacher with concrete suggestions for the letter of recommendation. Um, they should also check in with their counselor to see um, if they are going to be writing a, a letter for them also. 
Um, so the, the school counselor can tell them if they need a, a counselor letter also. So other summer activities for rising seniors can, does include finalizing that college list um, and taking college tours. While it's not ideal to take a summer college tour, if that's the only time that you can take it, I would highly suggest to do some college tour, tours. During the tours, students can talk to admissions officers, see the campus and hear about the programs and also the student life. Um, you may not be able to see the students that go to the school or talk with professors, but it's hi I highly suggest getting on campuses this summer. Um, the tours can help finalize the college list and determine if you apply early action, early decision or regular decision. Um, as far as applications and essays are concerned, the summer provides a, a good time for students to brainstorm their essays, reflect and spend time writing the essay. Um, you know, students aren't worried about their school work, so they're fresh. Um, and they could actually ask their families to help them brainstorm also. Um, there are some supplemental essays too um, that students can write over the summer. And this allows students time to research some of those supplemental essays because some of those schools will have three to four of those supplemental questions. Yeah, I, I, you're right there, Lisa, because I noticed, I've, I've seen that with a lot of students that they're really blindsided by how much essay writing there is. And, and they're under the impression that, oh, I'll just do the Common App essay and I'm good to go. But the reality of it is that each school might have a few essays of their own. So if they apply to 10 schools, they could be writing upwards of, you know, at least 20 essays. And yeah. so it's a lot of work. And that's why you're right. It's important over the summer to, to really plan that out. And that's, I think, what we do so well is helping kids look at your whole summer. What essays do you have to write? What are the topics? And having a plan of action for getting those done over the summer. Um, going back to the brag sheet, so you mentioned letters of recommendation from teachers. Tell us a little bit about how that might be different than the letter of recommendation from the counselor. So the, the colleges want to hear what type of student, uh, academic student, that the applicant is. So they, they want to hear about potential projects that they've worked on, um, how they work within a classroom, um, potentially a, uh, something that they learned in the class, as well as, you know, how, how are their study habits, all of those things teachers can write about. Um, the counselor recommendation pretty much cover, covers the student as a human being. So it's how the student fares within the class, as well as some of the things that they've done on the outside. Um, if there's been any special circumstances for the family, those are all things that the counselor recommendation would um, cover. So in school districts where kids barely know their counselors, where the ratio is maybe 300 to one, how does the counselor know what to write about the child? How, does, how do they communicate that information correctly? Well, I would say that it's up to the student to take that, take some initiative and get to know their counselor. Um, but also, you know, at the time that they're writing, they're asking for the letter, um, I would present the, the counselor with a potential resume or stuff that the student has done outside of school so that they are aware of some of the things that maybe, um, maybe the school isn't aware of. Um, and then there's also some counselors will actually send a parent questionnaire home because who knows your child better than anybody but the parent. So that, that would be uh, something that I would ask a counselor if they would do. Awesome, thank you for that, Lisa. So let's talk a little bit about researching colleges. Tell us what kids um, of all ages, so this is not just for kids that are juniors gonna be seniors, but really kids throughout high school can think about researching colleges. Yes, it's never too early to start the process um, to research. And so when you, whether you look at school's websites, whether you talk with friends that have attended there, if you can take a self tour um, or an official tour, um, they also have virtual tours on campus. Um, the more colleges you see and the more educated you become about the college um, helps in the research. So taking schools off the list is just as important as putting them on. Um, and understanding the college, the college requirements, uh, entrance requirements is so helpful when just picking out your courses for school. Um, so whether it's a local college that you can do in a day, um, or if you're on a trip somewhere, if you're planning a trip to California and you wanna see UC, um, they are, they're back open after shutting down for COVID and doing a lot of those schools are doing um, in-person tours. All you need to do is call the admissions office or book it online. Fabulous, thank you, Lisa. So in addition to researching colleges over the summer, um, kids can also be thinking about standardized tests. And 
you know, there's two sides to this because although many schools are test optional now, scores still can make a difference in whether the student is accepted or not. Can you talk a little bit about the value of uh, taking a test in the first place and then maybe what kids can do this summer? Yeah, so <clears throat> I recommend that students, when they're ready to take that, both the SAT and the ACT to see which one they like better. They're definitely different tests, um, but it, just having that experience of trying both of them at, at, um, and seeing you know, what you can compare the scores and see which one you like better and which one you do better on. Um, but even signing up for the question of the day um, online through College Board or ACT, you could schedule a weekly session, um, sign up for tutoring, go through the SAT book. Um, you can also, the, the um, younger kids can get a calendar together to see what the test dates are and the registration um, dates so that they feel more organized and don't miss any of those uh, registration deadlines. That's right. And statistically speaking, you know, although there's a push in our area for kids to test early and often, um, the best scores kids can obtain are in the spring of their junior year. And so many kids will take a practice SAT and ACT, kind of to your point, Lisa, like take both, see which we put them in into a concordance table for kids, see which test they score best on. About a third of a kid, third of students score, it's definitive. They score better on one test than another. But for about two thirds of kids, it's kind of a toss up. Um, so once you determine your best test, you really just want to prepare and take that test. You don't need to spread your focus on two tests. And um, that way you have a solid score that you can, if you prepare and take that test, usually kids take, will take a test two to three times, that score can be really helpful to you because it may be that on your list, and you talked about finalizing your list, you know, you have reached schools where maybe if your score is a 30 and you're applying to UVA, you may not submit that because it's, it's maybe not good enough to help your application. But if you're applying to like CNU or another school that's not nearly as competitive, it would be an amazing score. So in general, a score can help you. Maybe you won't submit it to all your schools, but it can definitely help you for some schools. Um, so Lisa, can you tell us a little bit about where you see the test optional movement going and um, why it's important to kids of, of, you know, not just the students now that are current juniors, but also younger students as well? Yeah, I think for the rising seniors, I think the colleges are going to remain test optional. Every webinar and every college admissions person I've spoken to has said that they are going to be test optional. But I do think they are looking at the data and they're kind of analyzing uh, the students that were admitted under the test optional policies to see how they're actually doing in school. And I think that down the road, it potentially could come back into play the testing. So that's why I encourage students to continue, you know, trying the test and then making the decision after they've taken their last test, whether they're going to apply test optional or not. That's a great point. And if your child's interested in taking a mock test, so these scores are not reported to anybody, they're just your information, they don't go on your child's record, um, you know, just for your child to take. These are retired tests, so they're virtually the same as the current tests. And we offer them um, virtually with the live proctor on Saturday morning, so kids can roll out of bed and take them. And you can see the upcoming dates here, and they're $20. Um, and uh, this is a great way to get for kids to get their feet wet. So maybe if they've taken a PSAT, they can sit for an ACT, um, which is different. Or maybe they want to take both tests and, and you know, we'll put those into a concordance table for them and see how they do. So if you hold up your phone and you open a camera and you hold the camera to this QR code, you can see a link and that will take you to the schedule of upcoming tests and you can register there. All right, so Lisa, um, moving on from testing, let's talk about the resume and how important it is in helping kids to really portray themselves as a unique individual and, and differentiate themselves among other students. Yeah, so <clears throat> students' resumes, they highlight the most significant achievements that the student has had in high school. Um, so you want to try to find some kind of thematic approach to 
what you're doing outside of school. Um, colleges do look for consistency over the four years. They don't look for a student to do a million things a couple hours a year. They want to see long-term commitments. Um, and so they, so I can give you a couple examples of some of those long-term commitments. Any kind of sport is definitely a long-term long -term commitment or um, Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts um, or some things that volunteer service that you've done every single year um, for, for three or four years and that you might have taken a leadership position in. Um, so other consistency, consistency is the key to um, the resume. And so not doing a uh, hundred things, so. Yeah, that's a great point. Gone are those days for sure. <laughs> Um, and it, it's also meaningful to help develop a narrative or, or kind of like your brand. Can you talk a little bit about finding that um, through line into your into all the things you've done and why that's important? Yeah, so I was actually on a webinar today and this was um, this is something I've heard um, from many colleges, which was, you know, they ask a student a lot of times what why they're choosing the major that they're choosing. And so they wanna see what kind of research the student has done based on that major. So some students who have never done anything um, within that certain major kind of, they don't know if they um, will follow through with that major. So um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about ways that you can get that theme, thematic pr approach or the brand, um, but just kind of staying in one lane um, would, is what, they're, what the colleges are, are looking for. Can you give an example of what a lane might look like? Yeah, a so I have a that's stuck to a lane. <laughs> a student that's stuck to a lane. So I have a student who's um, interested in horticulture, and um, he has done many things in horticulture. He actually had a plant room, um, which is kind of fun to talk about because he he grafted plants and um, did all different things with growing plants. Um, and he actually has done has is taking a class this summer. Uh, through NC State. Um, it's a, a horticulture class and he's also working at a nursery. So that's a good example of someone who's kind of taken, taken one lane and kind of tried different things. So yeah, I had a similar experience with my youngest son who um, he's now in college and um, he was really interested in the time and video production. Um, but he just kind of dabbled in it. He wasn't quite sure what he really if he really wanted to major in it but um I knew that that would be his his lane into to many schools and so he um was doing things on the side with a friend um making videos for different bands and so then he incorporated the he, he started a business in Fairfax County it cost 25 dollars to get a business license um and that was compelling and he took a class at George Mason in video production over the summer to show like he was in his lane and these are the things that he did um, based on his major. He ended up changing once he got there, <laughs> but which a lot of kids do, but those are examples of, um, you know, helping schools to see what you're interested in and um, that you've kind of, you've been deep into something instead of doing lots and lots of different things. A couple of questions before we move on. Um, a parent asked, what is a good time to start applications? So the, the Common App is typically what students will use, and they can open a Common App anytime. So you can open it your freshman year. Um, you know, I would say um, it rolls over in the summer so that you, um, all the data that you put in there, um, let's say juniors are doing it right now, it would roll over. And you can't hit the submit button until after August 1st. Um, and who would want to do that because kids don't even may not even know where they want to apply. Um, but the application process goes from August 1st, pretty much until through the fall, all the way up until I think probably the last deadlines like January 15th or so. Great. Um, Gloria asked, is there a database or app that's great for managing and organizing the application process? And we use, well, Lisa works with students um, and our other college planners, we use College Planner Pro. And it allows kids to, it allows us to help the student craft a list, keep track of um, what schools are applying to, their due dates, the uh, required essays. It has a list of each school they're applying to and their chance of admittance um, based on their GPA and other factors. Also, um, 
on a local level, kids can use Naviance or if they have Naviance at their school. Um, Lisa, what were some others that you've seen students use? Uh, SCORE is one that some schools have gone through and Maya, Maya Learning. So um, yeah, those are the ones that I, I've known of, about, yeah. So the school usually has, um, sometimes kids don't know about it if they're sophomores or freshmen, but you can ask the counselor, where can I see information on college planning? And in Fairfax County, for example, it's Naviance and you can log in and you can see um, where even as detailed as where students from your school went to college, what the acceptance rate, because where they got in from your school is way more important than the national average. Um, for example, GPA, it's important to know what the GPA is from your school not as much the national average because you're just competing with students are just competing with kids from their school. So when should the PSAT be taken? Is it true if it's taken in middle school that you can get a letter of acceptance from colleges based on the PSAT? I've, I've never... not seen it taken in middle school and I've never <laughs> seen a letter of acceptance based on a PSAT. Have you seen that, Lisa? Never, no. Okay, okay, yeah. And then um, what do you do if your child does not know what their lane is? Can you talk about that, Lisa? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there are career interest inventories out there and call it our College Planner Pro has one um, that, that kind of looks at personality, skills, interests, um, aptitudes, all of those things. Um, but, I, but I also think that it's up to the student to start doing some research on what what, um, what they might be interested in, um, maybe by doing job shadow situations or talking to people that are in that career. There's a lot of career interests, um, uh, a lot of career websites that can help students kind of find their lane. Yeah. What are you, so before we talk about taking summer classes and summer work, I know that you do that with, with kids, Lisa. Why is that valuable? And why is that help? What is the name of the assessment? And then um, why is that helpful to kids? So it's called Achieve Works. Um, there are three different assessments. They're all about a half an hour each that the students can take. Um, there's another one out there that we that I would recommend younger kids maybe take, and it's called View Science. Um, and that's a little bit longer. That is actually a 90 minute um, a 90 minute assessment. And what's important about it, and I can just give you an example of just a student I spoke with last week. She was um, de determined to, to go into aerospace engineering. And so, you know, I pulled up the list of schools for her with aerospace engineering. She didn't like any of them. And I said, well, you might want to think about a general engineering major because, you know, there's such a small amount of student schools and there are usually large flagship schools that have that aerospace engineering. It's a very expensive program to run. So we, you know, she's a sophomore right now. And I think that over the summer, we're going to do some career interest inventory and see if that's what she truly wants to do. Thank you, Lisa, for that. Um, Tamara asks, do colleges really expect that seniors know what they want to major in? What about kids that have no idea and have tried a variety of activities rather than Ben and Elaine? Well, they can't, the students can apply undecided. Um, so that is an option. There are some schools that will not I mean, force a student to apply to a certain college. So the kids that are, are uh, undecided tend to go to liberal arts schools, um, which is fine. It's fine. I mean, it's, there isn't, uh, as long as they have a good solid resume and good grades, they can go to a liberal arts school and, um, you know, end up with a great liberal arts degree. Thank you. T let's talk a little bit about summer classes. Tell us why this might be helpful to a student. And then so, we'll talk about summer work. Okay, so summer classes, you know, this is a time that students can actually explore an area of interest. So students can take uh, an online high school class or they could go to a community college and try a class. Um, not only can these courses help, you know, keep you kind of thinking about what you wanna do, but they also can could potentially help your GPA because some schools will let you transfer those eight, um, college level classes to your high school transcript at an AP uh, weight. Um, but it can also show colleges that you're dedicated to learning new things or improving your academic resume. Um, I've had students take a range of classes over the summer. Um, I have 
business entrepreneur classes, sometimes high schools don't offer those. So that might be a good one if students are interested in taking uh, in, in exploring more about business. Thank you for that. What about summer work? Why is this helpful to kids? So, so, you know, if you're not going to volunteer and you don't play a sport or, you know, you know, it, finding a job is always a good thing to do. So any type of work experience, can, you know, whether it's scooping ice cream or um, working as a camp counselor, it shows a commitment and a dedication and it can put some money in your pocket. So um, if, if, if you can't find a job, which um, potentially you might be too young, there could be in internships, um, there could be some, like I mentioned, job shadows before, um, or they could, there could be some volunteer work that you could do out there. Um, it, some of these, um, the job shadows I mentioned, they can help uh, students determine what the level of education and what other opportunities might be out there. Um, so I have a student, I was kind of talking about a little bit, he is a fly fisherman, so he loves to fish. Um, and he decided he was going to create his own flies. And so he designs and creates the flies and then he sells them. So a simple thing like that um, shows he has an entrepreneurial spirit. Um, it just, it was pretty amazing to see kind of the, the passion he has for fishing and how it's come out in something that he can kind of show. Sure, that's compelling. If he loves fishing, he started this company. Um, it's his passion. Is something like that simple, compelling to a school? Yes, yes, especially if he wants to study entrepreneurship. I mean, I, the colleges love students that think outside the box um, or are trying different things or focusing on a passion area that takes you down one road, um, definitely. What about summer programs? How are these different than actual summer courses? So some colleges uh, offer what we call pre-college programs um, or potentially summer camps. These are all types of summer programs. They, um, the way they present themselves is an opportunity to explore your field of interest in greater depth um, and develop some skills, but then you can also meet like-minded students. Um, and it also gives you an experience on a college campus. Um, most programs that are pre-college or are these camps will offer a dorm room. So student would go to a summer program and they would spend a week. They would go to some classes. They would have, um, they would live in the dorms. They would eat the food. Um, so here, just a couple examples of ones that I've sent students to. Um, Notre Dame has a pre-college program. Boston University has one in research, science and engineering. Um, Stanford has one in the medical area. So there are, these are big schools that liked students to come on their campus in the summer because there are no students there and get to explore um, their uh, campus and to study something in their field. I think it helps with admission. It could, yes. Yeah, I can't promise, but I think it does help. Yeah, if you've been to the campus, um, maybe talk to the, sometimes when you're on those campuses, they take you on a campus tour so you can at least get that campus tour out of the way. You can tell the admissions officer that you're interested in applying there. All those things kind of start the process um, as soon as you give them their, your name and your uh, school. <laughs> Is that too late for this summer? Would this be something for possibly next summer? Yeah, there, this summer for, um, for students, it's probably too late. Most of these um, are, the applications are in the fall um, or spring. So it would be um, early spring. Um, that the applications would be due. Most of the competitive ones, um, it might be, it, it is too late pretty much for this summer. Okay, it's always something to think about for next summer. Mm -hmm. You recommend that students read. Uh, we all want our kids to read. <laughs> Why is this important when it comes to college admissions? I say this to my kids and, and they all just kind of roll their eyes. But um, every time, you know, summer reading is something that helps students prevent that summer slump. Um, I do think it does help on the English portions of those standardized tests to be help with reading fluency. Um, it can help build your vocabulary. Um, it, it, reading a lot of, I've seen students that love to read are really good writers. Um, so sometimes colleges will ask in an interview or ask on an application, what are you reading and why? And so to have a book in your pocket that you can talk about would be a would help you prepare for that. 
Thank you, Lisa. You also mentioned that kids should try something new over the summer. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I would say for the younger kids, <clears throat> trying something new, maybe they, and this goes back to, maybe they don't know what they want to study. So the only way that they're going to really figure that out is by trying some new things. Now, I'm not saying that you have to try a gazillion things, but one or two things like uh, finding a new hobby, you can, um, you can explore your city, do something cultural, decide to play an instrument, you know, step outside the box. I think students um, need to be pushed a little to take on some leadership activities, like take a hobby and put it to a good use, like you're starting a business. Um, other ways you could start a blog. Um, you could just reflect on some of your skills and your own abilities as a person. Um, so sign or find something that you're passionate about. All these things can be done in the summer um, and you don't have, you can still surf and you can still watch Netflix. So I love that story. You also <laughs> recommend that kids clean up their social media. Yes. Why is that? Yes. So in this, you know, I, I think students, maybe put things out there that they shouldn't. I have seen some things that I sh probably shouldn't have seen when I was working in the schools, um, but colleges can look at your at the public version of your social media. So there have been schools like Harvard that have rescinded admission on students that were putting out um, hateful memes or racist comments. Not that the students around here do that, but it's just something to kind of think about um, when, you're, when people are posting pictures um, on social media. Um, so your, dig your digital impre um, presence can, can leak through to admissions officers um, and give them a window to your personal life. And that's not something that you want to do. They, colleges want kids with high character that will um, embrace a diverse uh, and safe campus. So um, I would say if you're not going to say it to an admissions officer, I wouldn't put it out on social media. Um, another good suggestion is to get a professional um, email um, so that when you're communicating with admissions officers when it comes to college, that it is a professional email. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Well, I will tell you, I once worked with a girl who had the email Hot Buns 98. <laughs> <laughs> I encourage her to change that. Yes, yes. It's better if it's your first name, your middle initial, and your last name. Yes. Something easy. Okay, a couple of questions from parents. Um, how do you help kids that are really anxious or they might not be typical learners, kids that um, might be super nervous about finding a job or an internship? How do you encourage them to get out of their, um, kind of get out of their comfort zone and try something new? Well, they have to be probably of certain age, I would imagine, um, to get a job. So any, any kind of volunteer service, I think, is always good for the younger kids. Just to give, just to give them an idea, and I'll give you an example. My stepdaughter, um, I made her go to, um, to summer school to, to be like a counselor for the summer, younger summer school kids. And she came home and she said, I don't want to work with kids. So she kind of figured out that even though her evil stepmother made her go to a, uh, a school and work. She worked all summer with the little kids. Um, she decided that she didn't want to do that. So um, I do think that any experience that sh you can get um, in volunteer service is helpful to kind of break through that, um, that shyness. And a lot of shy kids love animals. I've volunteered at Homeward Trails for a long time. And in the summer, they have a summer camp for kids. It's like a week and a half. And then kids can also volunteer helping the animals. So that might be something that kids feel comfortable doing as well. And it doesn't have um, to be out there. It can be like at the library or at, you know, at a food bank that there's just stock and shelves. They're not having to entertain anybody. So it could be something that's very, uh, can be helpful for introverts too. Yes, for sure. A parent asked, how do um, colleges use summer camps? And I'm not sure this is from Sabrina, if she means like that they're a counselor at summer camps or that they go to summer camps. Do you have any th thoughts on that? Well, this, there are definitely, I mean, if a student is working as a camp counselor at a summer camp, I have a couple kids that have done it every summer and they've kind of gone up the chain and worked at the, and they're kind of a leader now. They started as a counselor and now they're a lead counselor. Um, so I do think that, um, that, you know, any kind, that's a job. And so it shows commitment. 
Um, if she's talking about the summer camps as far as the colleges that are concerned, some of those um, are academically focused. And so those would probably be better than the ones that are just you know, going and playing um, games at the college. Is there anything wrong with that? She said, is that okay for your child to just go attend summer camps? Maybe that wouldn't be something you put on your resume. Uh, it could be. I mean, if they, I mean, in high school, they're going to summer camps. So it's, it's, it's fine. It's not, you know, I would definitely put it on the resume if, especially if they get to a point where they're in a leadership role. That's a great point. All right, so we're gonna to go to more questions in just a moment. So if you have a question right now, please put it in the chat and we're gonna to get to it in just a minute. Um, anything else about social media that you wanna mention, Lisa? No, I'm, I'm, I just like to say that because I think that students are not aware of their digital presence. And so just kind of highlighting that at this point is a good thing. Great. Right. So if you're like many parents out there right now, you might be feeling overwhelmed by all that's to do and all the things your child could be doing over the summer. So let me share with you how we can help. If you have a child who's going in um, to, they're in the fall, they're gonna be a rising ninth, 10th or 11th grader. We have specific programs for them where we help them with their summer planning. We help them develop a preliminary list of schools that it's preliminary, but it contains some schools for safety, target, and reach. We advise them on academic course selection. And although students already selected their courses in the spring, it's not too late to change them. So oftentimes we find that kids might be in the wrong math progression, or um, that's super common, or there, may be, there might be another class that they can take instead of one they signed up for that can help develop their narrative about a bit more. Kids can still, through the summer, switch classes, so it isn't too late for that. Um, we help kids create their high school resume, and um, we'll help them open up a, um, an account if that's in the Common App, if they're ready, and we'll help them develop their school resume, and if not, we'll help them um, create one. And then this is what Lisa was talking about earlier, AchieveWorks, which is through College Planner Pro. That's the program that we use. Um, we have three college counselors on staff now, and it's an assessment, as she mentioned, that allows kids to explore their interests. They, it helps them learn more about their personality, the skills that they're naturally good at, and really can help kids feel great about themselves and understand a little bit more about their um, abilities. Lisa, is there anything else you wanna add about career exploration or finding um, your narrative? Um, you know, I just, I think parents are, might be getting a little hung up on the major. Um, and I think you're absolutely right that kids could start in one direction and switch directions. I mean, who they are as a freshman in high school may not be who they are as a senior. So don't panic on that. I, I feel like maybe there's a little panic that they don't know what they want to do. So, but it, it always is good to kind of reflect on your, your skills and aptitudes and personality just to kind of, um, just understand what, what would maybe go, be a good position, good career for you. And then for our rising 12th graders, we'll finalize their summer planning now. We will refine their list with them. So making sure that they have the right schools in the right category. Um, we often see that kids have a lot of schools, especially that many colleges are test optional now kids that wouldn't have applied to schools because of the test requirement are now applying to a lot of high reach schools. So their lists are unbalanced. Um, we help them make sure that they have a balanced list. So they're gonna get into a lot of great schools. And Lisa, you had mentioned something um, a while back that really stuck with me. And it's about the, the schools on the safety part of the list. Um, a lot of times kids will just slap on a few schools just to kind of have a backup. What do you think about that approach or what would you recommend in creating the list? Well, when I talk to students, I highly encourage them to have all the schools on their list be a school that they'd be happy at. So even, even though we call it a safety, no, you know, I, I truly believe that in this admissions world, nothing is a safety anymore. So there, you know, I do think that I would like for kids to be happy at any of the schools that they get into. That's a great point. Um, we'll also assist with their testing plan. So we help them map out whether they're going to be best for the SAT or ACT. 
and then it will help them create a testing plan to determine um, when they're going to take the test and if any preparation is needed. We'll help them schedule and plan their college visits, prepare them for the interviews. Um, we'll assist with essay ideas, making sure that their essays are technically correct and um, help them through the proofreading and editing process. And then um, really get everything done on their college application so that whether they're applying early action or early decision, they have it done by November 1st, generally, or if they're applying regular decision, they have everything done in January. So really planning out their summer and making sure they're on target to meet those deadlines. So that's how we help kids. Um, and Lisa can help you if you should have the need. So if that's the case, you can hold your phone up to this QR code and you can schedule a time with Erin. She's our um, program manager for college counseling and she can talk to you about your needs and share with you a little bit about our program to see if it's a match. And this is also on our website, bctutoring.com. So to wrap up, my name is Ann Dolan. It's been great to have you with us tonight. This is Lisa Gastaldi. You can reach us at Ann at EC Tutoring and Lisa at EC Tutoring. Um, and our number is here, should you want to call 703-934-8282. All right, so um, before we go to questions, I wanna share with you our next webinars. We have one on the summer slide. And this is generally, if you have younger kids from K to eighth grade, um, we have Tyson and Barb joining us and they are amazing and they have lots of great ideas for kids to do over the summer. And then following up on our college series, um, our next webinar is on June 1st. It's seven top trends from a former UVA admissions evaluator. And Kristen has been in UVA admissions for 11 years. She's now on our staff and um, she's gonna talk to you about what it takes to get into UVA and other top tier colleges and how you can help your child stand out. So that's June 1st. Um, June 15th, the secrets to making college applications stand out to that point. That's also with Kristen. And then lastly, um, this is a guest presenter we have. She wrote the book, How to College. And it's all about building critical adulting skills in high school and how you can help your kids um, be ready to launch when they actually go off to college. And you can find all this information on our website, which is ectutoring.com slash webinar dash series. All right, so um, we're going to go to Q&A now, and please note that after Q&A, when you log off, you're going to see a survey pop up, and if you could be so kind to fill out the survey so we know what you like and what was helpful, I would very much appreciate it. Okay, so let's go to our chat. Um, do you help students hone their college essays? And Lisa, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes, actually, I'm working with my, my rising seniors right now, and we have started the process. Um, I give them actually two exercises to do um, before we have our first brainstorming meeting to kind of hone in on their values and potentially, uh, you know, what we could write the essay about. So then it's a back and forth situation where we brainstorm. I read the essay, get it back to them, depending on how, how good the essay is and um, there, we also will work on the supplemental essays too. Parent mentioned that her child um, isn't a born leader and that they really shy away from leadership roles. The question is, do you push them into a leadership role or just realize, you know what, maybe it's part of their personality to sit back a little bit. What do you think about that, Lisa? Well, you know, it depends about the age, I would say. Um, but a lot of kids can be... Um, kind of what we consider silent leaders in that they are good role models for people, uh, for younger kids, um, or they're, they're a good friend to their friend group. Um, so if, if she's, he or she is comfortable with that, then that is fine. Um, it would be great to see um, kind of some things on her resume that maybe eventually push the envelope and she tries something new. But um, there are definitely kids out there that don't want to be leaders, but that's okay. We're all, we can all be, you know, a follower too. So. Absolutely. Um, somebody asked if there will be a recording and the answer is yes, we're recording this and we'll be sure to send it out to you tomorrow. So when you get it, if you find it to be helpful, you can always forward it to a friend that may have missed this. Um, anything that middle schoolers can start working on now or rising ninth graders? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, I do think it's just exploration right now for those middle schoolers. Um, I go back to the volunteer and I know I've kind of hammered that home, but that's a situation that you don't have to be a minimum age um, and you can try different things. Um, and just, you know, there are students that are that I've met with that are mid middle schoolers rising to ninth graders um, that are going to try different clubs in school also. So if there are clubs at school to get involved in, that would be great too. Jennifer asked, um, her, her son is at TJ, which is a very high performing school for science and technology, and he's interested in engineering. He's a rising 12th grader. What could he be doing this summer? She wants to know. He doesn't have any plans right now. Oh, that's a hard one. So you know, I would say, it, does he know what type of engineering he wants to get into? It would be great to kind of research what the different types of engineering are. Um, hopefully, hopefully he has some schools on his list that he's thinking about. I would maybe explore the colleges that he's looking at to see what the curriculums are so that he knows kind of what the engineering courses are. Um, Cause some, some take, some go one path and another go another path. So if he's not really sure what engineering piece to do, then it would be good to, to kind of explore that. Um, if he, it depends what math he's in, you know, if he's not, if he hasn't taken, um, I would say a calculus class by his senior year, maybe he wants to take a course this summer um, to try to get into a calculus class the senior year. So um, there are um, different things that he could be doing this summer as far as, um, you know, just researching careers. A couple of people asked, what is a professional email for a student? And <laughs> I, I let me rephrase that. It doesn't have to be, you know, Mr. Tom Smith, but <laughs> it, it doesn't, it, it should it be anything offensive or too gimmicky or silly. Um, it, it really could just be the student's first and last name, their initials and a number. Um, anything like that is perfectly fine. What you don't want is an email that um, college admissions folks kind of look sideways. Like, why would you pick that? That might be bad judgment. <laughs> if your child has that type of email, then I might change it. Well, and the other thing about getting a good email address for colleges to contact you, um, you know, some students are using emails for different things. And so to have one specific email that they're using just for college applications could could make it that they don't miss anything. Sometimes um, the college admissions stuff goes to junk and the kids miss it. So to have one dedicated email that they know um, that they are using for college is also a good choice. I love that idea because those um, messages from colleges come in fast and furiously, that's for sure. Um, somebody asked, how can people providing a letter of recommendation submit their letter in the admission system? So it depends on the school. So if it's a teacher letter, I think, is that is that what they're saying on a teacher letter? Um, I think so, probably okay. so. So teacher letters typically um, get loaded into Naviance, which is, or SCORE, um, if they have, if the school has that platform. And then um, either the counselor or the teacher then sends it to the Common App. Um, if there isn't, that platform, then the common application has a situation where the student would put in recommenders and it would send the teacher an email and they would <clears throat> then just load it to the common app. Typically students never see the letters of recommendation. Nina asked, will the common app prompts be available for rising seniors right now so they can work on them this summer, which we know yes. And then are they the same as, last, as this year's admission cycle? Yes. And they're on the web. So you could Google common app prompts for 20, it's 2022, 2023. <laughs> I have to think about that. Awesome. Thank you. Um, let's see. Are there any good online schools? Um, are there any good online schools for middle school? My son has to go to school remotely due to his medical issues. And um, there's one called Laurel Springs that we think is great and that could be an option. So you can go to their website, that's a private online school. And then um, so somebody asked, when should students start visiting and touring colleges? The sooner, the better, I would say. So I encourage students to, um, to take notes when they go to campuses. Um, 
there is a college, I, I do have a college visit check sheet that you can that you can download off the web if you just Google college, um, college visit check sheet. Um, it will give you things to look for on the college visits. But um, I do think that the more school, more school students are able to do throughout high school helps formulate the list. Because at this point, right now, I'm talking to my juniors who have never been to a college and they have no idea what they're looking for. So um, it, if you have time during the school year, that's probably the best time to go versus the summer if you have that luxury of starting early. Because then you can actually see the kids on campus and maybe talk to some of the teachers or professors. Um, we have two questions, one from B and one for David, really asking the same thing. Any advice for high functioning, twice exceptional kids or neuro neurodiverse kids? And how do high schools and colleges view disabilities such as ADD or ADHD? So that would be another good thing to kind of, uh, if you're, if to look at, you can make an appointment with a disability office at a college to talk about what kinds of accommodations they offer for students um, as far as when the students get there. A lot of times admissions officers also would know, but you can kind of tell um, on their website if there's a, there is a big uh, disability page that offers a lot of accommodations. And how do colleges look at it as far as admissions? Um, it depends if the student self-identifies. So if they self-identify in a positive way, it can be looked at positively. Um, you know, I think if it's something that um, it would require some coaching on how to put it in an essay, if that's something that they wanted to do. And some kids, you know, don't ever say that they have a disability, but they still get accommodations at school. And, um, you know, if you get extra time on the SAT or ACT, for example, you don't have to tell the school, the school doesn't know. That's just your information. And so it, it really comes to what you want to share with the school. Um, my daughter is in seventh grade. Does volunteer work this summer count towards um, her college application? Um, no, it doesn't. So, but it would be still good for her to do. Um, typically colleges look for nine through 12. So when kids are filling out the common application and it asks for what year did you complete this? Um, it, there isn't a seventh grade on there. Um, but I think any, any kind of experience like that is a good thing. So just do it for self-fulfillment versus doing it for the college application. Great. What do you think about a summer study abroad program, including a homestay and a language program? This would be in addition to a normal academic year of study in the same language, of that same language. If the student can do it, I think it's fabulous. Um, you know, <clears throat> I think what happens to a lot of kids, though, and not this isn't like a summer program, but I think for um, for home, for um, like mission trips and things like that, I think a lot of kids do mission trips and go to somewhere, uh, my uh, third world country and build houses. And they think that they can use that for their college essay. And it becomes kind of like writing about a sport that, you know, you really have to be careful what you're writing uh, in the essay because a lot of kids do those mission trips and they will highlight that, yes, they went and built houses. And so you have to kind of find a, a way to, if you're gonna use that for your essay um, and put it on your college application, it's gonna have to be something different. Thank you, Lisa. And also the folks that asked about kids with ADHD, twice exceptional or neurodiverse diverse kids, um, Lisa does college counseling specific to students with ADHD and, and Melissa put that link in um, the chat just now. All right, Gloria asked, is there an online forum that parents can connect with each other and share ideas and advice? I don't know, do you know, Lisa? Um, no, I don't have any idea. We'll, we'll look for you, Gloria. Um, <laughs> and then our last question for the evening is, during the summer, is it better to volunteer in a field you're interested in or to get an internship? Either. I think, I, I mean, I think we're, we're splitting hairs here. I think any experience that the student can have is a good experience. So um, if an internship presents itself, and those are hard to come by, honestly. So, um, and uh, then I think that would be a great situation. Um, but if you can't find an internship, volunteering or working or something is always good. Awesome. 
Thank you, Lisa. You're just such a wealth of knowledge, and I learned a lot myself. Thank you for being part of our webinar tonight. It was great to see you, as always. Thank and you. And parents, um, thank you so much for being here this evening. As I mentioned, there will be a quick survey that will pop up just at the end of this, and I would appreciate it if you take a minute to, to take it. I'm uh, Thank you so much for all the kind comments. I'm glad that everybody has found this to be helpful. Have a great evening, everybody, and see you at one of our upcoming webinars. Take care and bye-bye.